Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for joining once again for another session of the King. We're back again as we're going to start a new series and uh, uh, continue down the same path as previous um, time. The Holy Spirit led me to continue to speak on the kingdom of God. And so I'm picking up tonight. I'm teaching another series or teaching on kingdom living now. That's the title of my series. And we're going to be studying tonight Matthew chapter 13 um, and, and the parables of Jesus. The kingdom of God is a word I keep on repeating because the message of Jesus was the kingdom. And I'm going to prove to you in my studies that he only preached the kingdom. He gave instruction and command, specific command that the disciples should speak about the kingdom. The kingdom is the message that should be preached today. That's not being preached. And so the kingdom is the message that needs to be preached before the end of the world comes. And so the reason I continue to pick up in the series on the kingdom is I'm going to show you biblically that your kingdom living is not something you do when you get to heaven. It's something you start to live in and practice now. So I'm going to be doing a series of teaching, hopefully a two-part series on this one, Matthew chapter 13, the parables of Jesus. And each parable, I'm going to break them down for you to understand them and the application of them. And so we're going to cover that. But before I get started in teaching, on Matthew chapter 13. I want to set the foundation or get you prepared so when you get into Matthew chapter 13, you're going to know exactly what Jesus preached. You will know exactly what the disciples preached. And I'm going to give you examples after examples to show you that the message that should be preached and should have been preached in all our churches is the kingdom. But because most don't have a concept or understanding, they preach the gospel without the kingdom. And that's the problem we have it. What we're getting in most of our mainline denomination churches is something called a half-truth. The gospel is good news, but there's an off there that they keep on missing because their eyes have not been opened, their ears have not been opened to the kingdom message. And that's the reason why there's such seem to be a, a, a blight, I would call it a blight in most of the people's life that's not living up to their full potential, their purpose, their identity, or their destiny. There is a struggle going on in the churches, mainline churches today, where people are trying to live right, trying to read the word, trying to pray. Um, they're trying to believe God, and they, they're doing things that they believe that God is pleased with. And don't recognize if you have the wrong concept, you're going to end up with the wrong conclusions. And that's the reason why most of our prayer is not really changing anything. Our words is not affecting the world. The world is affecting us. And so we don't see the signs and wonders and miracles as we ought to see. We should be seeing more demonstration of power. We don't see that. We're not seeing blind eyes open, deaf ear, lame, walk the whole nine yard. Not in the mainline churches. It does happen on occasion outside of our country. It does happen once in a while here, but not in the same amount or capacity as it was in the book of Acts and the New Testament. We don't see a lot of that because if we preach the wrong message, the manifestation won't be there. And that's our praise and effective, reading the word we don't understand it, and we're struggling unnecessarily because we're presenting the wrong message. So my teaching is all about getting us to understand what Jesus' message was, how we are to live, how we are to walk, who we are, how you function in earth, and he came that you may have life and life more abundantly. In heaven? No. Here on the earth. And that's why I'm saying your kingdom living is not something you do when you get to heaven. That's the reason why I don't really, you don't hear me preach about a lot about going to heaven. Because if you understand who you are, your kingdom authority is on the earth. I am not saying there will not be a day we go to heaven. What I'm saying is the focus of the church is getting people from earth to heaven. But do you know in the Hebrew culture and the Jewish culture, they don't preach a lot about heaven? Because they understand the dominion power of man is on the earth. So they talk about living a better life here on the earth. Because we have the misconception. So most Christians are trying to escape the world to go to heaven. They say to be with Jesus. When Jesus says, I've given you authority and dominion over earth. You bind stuff here, I bind it here. You lose something here, I lose it there. So your power and the life he gives you is to live an overcoming life here and now. So when you step into eternity in the kingdom of living, you know how to live it. Because you've been practicing while you're here on the earth in time. Alright, let's go. Let's, let's, Go from there. <clears throat> for those of you joining for the first time, welcome aboard. We're in for another session again in Kingdom Living Now. And I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing now because the kingdom ought to be lived in your life now. But because most don't understand it, they're trying to live it down the road. And most of our life is operating in dysfunction. And we need to fix that problem. So for those of you joining for the first time, thank you for coming on board. You're in for a journey. I always recommend people bring a notebook or pencil. I'm going to challenge your mind to think, to reason things out. I'm going to challenge you to research as well. Just don't take my word for it. If this studies and the studies that I do come out of my own research, my own revelation, investigation, 
um, things revealed to me by the Holy Spirit. And so I challenge you, if you want to get what I have, do exactly what I did to get what I got. That's available to you. But you got to be willing to step into a new realm of thinking. Your mind needs to be renewed and be transformed. Change your mind, change your thinking, get changed the results. Keep the old mindset, old thinking, nothing changed. We keep getting the same results. So the kingdom message is all about renewing our mind, being transformed by the renewal, how we think, how we approach, how we see things through our eyes and our ear. Okay. All right. That being said, let's jump into this. And before I said, before I get to Matthew chapter 13, verse 1 through 58, I'm going to show you some scriptures here and start to present to you what Jesus preached. So when I get to Matthew chapter 13, I'm going to show you scripturally what they all preach before we get into Matthew chapter 13. So you understand. So when you get to the parables, it'll make more sense to your mind. All right, let's begin. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus only preached the kingdom. Here's my question to you. Is Jesus our example? Is he the one we're supposed to be emulating and copying? If your answer is yes, then my question is, in, then everything that Jesus says and does, should we not be copying that? Should he not be our standard? Should he not be our example? So if you see something that Jesus did, and if you check your life and your life is not measuring up to what Jesus did, do you change Jesus or do you change what you're doing to meet up what Jesus is doing or has done? So many of you try and get the word to adapt to their life. When you're last supposed to adapt to the word, the word don't change. Our lives are supposed to. So Jesus shows an example, and he was the example set from the Father to demonstrate to the sons of God what it means to be a son of God. Then we're supposed to become more like him. We're supposed to walk and act and think and move in like manner as Jesus. So if you read something scripture Jesus did, we should be emulating it, copying it, and acting in like fashion. Isn't that true? Yes. So Matthew chapter 9 verse 35 says this, Jesus, by the way, let me say something here about the name Jesus. I know most of you use it and God shows us mercy in translation. He gives us kindness and, you know, in the time of our ignorance. His name Jesus is Yeshua. Well, Yeshua in the Hebrew is Joshua. Okay, His actual name is actually Joshua. Okay, I know we know use Jesus. That's a translation from the, from the Greek and into the Roman and so forth. It's a translation, but his actual name is Joshua. In the Aramaic is Yehoshua. Okay, just we'll give this throw it out there. So, Yehoshua, Joshua, or in this case, Yeshua, went through all the towns and villages, all the towns and villages, right? Teaching in their, very important word, you see that in your Bible, not his, in their synagogues. What did he do? Jesus went through all the towns and villages. Didn't say it was in church. Teaching in their, not his, their, meaning it belongs to man, not to God, because it's their synagogue. And what did he proclaim? Proclaiming, another word for proclaiming is the word preaching, the good news, the word gospel means good news, right? Of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So you now see, when I get to Matthew chapter 13, when you read the word gospel, you got to recognize when it's used in your Bible, the gospel is attached to the kingdom. The short form of the kingdom is the gospel. But the gospel without the kingdom is not a message, it's an introduction. It's a good news. But what is the good news? Of the kingdom. Very important for me to say that to you so you understand. So Jesus went through, Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in there, not his. And the reason I'm using the emphasis on the word there is that we always associate the church to belong to him. Well, if the church is the synagogue, he would say his. Synagogue was man's idea. That's the building they built to teach and to gather the people, to instruct them. But it didn't say it belonged to God. So the synagogue didn't belong to him. We will call it today our churches. The church that Jesus built, do you not know you're my body, is the called out and separated ones unto God. Not a building, not a location. It is a people group that he has separated unto himself. So that's the reason why he used the terminology. So you don't get it messed up in your head to think that Jesus built a synagogue or a temple. He never did. He never wanted one. Because the church is not a building or a location. I know for some of you who are hearing me, this is going to mess up your head a little bit because we're so caught up in, in our double talk of associating the building to be the church versus we being the church. And there's a double talk going on in there. Well, we are the church, but we need to go to church. Really? Hmm. We need to read that again. 
Our double talk is not making no sense. It makes sense in our head when we say it. But the building is not God's church. Do you know that God does not dwell in building made by man's hand? That's man-made stuff. That's why it's their temple, their synagogue, because they're made by hands, not by God. Very important. And what did he do? He proclaimed or preached the good news of the kingdom of God, right? And as a result of that message, then the byproduct of kingdom living is there be healing of every disease and sicknesses and casting out demons, you name it. That is a byproduct of the kingdom of God being present with you, right? So where well, that's why Jesus says, when you pray, pray our Father who are in heaven, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. Then why? Because you want God's will to be done on earth. So wherever the kingdom manifests itself, there's going to be a sign of wonders and miracles that will follow after the kingdom. If you preach the message of the gospel without the kingdom, there won't be any signs of wonder following. That's why many of the messages we're hearing, you don't see a lot of manifestation. You hear a lot of good words, you hear a lot of opinion, you hear a lot of, you hear a lot of I think, I feel, or I believe, but where's the signs and wonders? They're not there. Because the good news without the kingdom, there's no manifestation of power. Very important for you to understand. Let me give you another scripture to show you. And I'm setting the foundation so when I get to Matthew chapter 13, it's going to make sense to you. But I need to show you the message that Jesus preached. That he himself preached only one message. He didn't preach healing. He didn't preach deliverance. He didn't preach prosperity. He didn't preach casting out demons. Yet in all those things, he manifested power over them, but he never preached them. He all the message he preached, the message the Father gave him. Say this, Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And from then on, he started to describe to you the manifestation, the power of the kingdom. That was his only message. Now, out of that message, healing manifests, but you don't magnify healing. That's just a byproduct of kingdom presence. Um, the dead raised back to life. Yet he raised more dead people than anybody else. Yet he had no ministry in raising the dead. He healed more people than most people were really healed. Yet he never ministered, never had a ministry in healing. That's just the manifestation and the, the manifestation of the kingdom of God being present. Healing signs and wonders is just the manifestation to prove that the kingdom of God has come to earth. That's all it's all about. Give you another scripture. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 15. That's Matthew 10, verse 5 through 15 to show you that not only did Jesus preach the kingdom of God, not the gospel, the kingdom, but also all his disciples preached it. Let me show you again. In Matthew chapter 5, chapter 10, verse 5 through 10, these 12 Jesus sent out and he commanded them. Now my question to you, is a command a suggestion? Is it a wish? Or is it an order? So he specifically gave them a command, he ordered them. And he says this, he sent them out and he says to them saying, do not go in the way of the Gentiles. This is the 12 disciples he's talking about. And do not enter in the city of the Samaritans. These are also Gentiles. But go right to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when he came to earth, when he sent them out, he sent them to the Jews first. Because remember now, salvation is of the Jews. So he had to send them to the chosen one. They've been known from Genesis. So right to be the God's chosen people. So he made sure he sent the message to them first, right? Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now question. How are they lost when they had the temple and had the priests and the high priests and the Sadducees and the the Pharisees and the scribes? How are they lost? Hmm, interesting question, huh? Could it be because mankind got entrapped on the earth, being instructed by men who had a misconception of the laws and the prophet? You're going to see him prove it later on. He said, you neither know scripture, as he accused them, nor do you understand the power of God. When the Sadducees ask him, in the resurrection, this woman had seven husbands, and she with all of them. Whose wife will whose wife will she be? He said, "You need to know scripture that tell me established religion may have an ignorance or lack of knowledge pertaining to scripture or the power of God." So they make assumptions. So he's accusing these guys who are the teacher of Israel, and he said he's sending the disciples to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That means Israel, even though they had the rabbi, the teachers, they were lost. And he said, now, as you go to them, preach, another word is preach, is proclaim, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Did you see it there? Did Jesus give specific instruction what they had to preach? Preach, proclaim, not the gospel. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's very specific. So my question is, how did we in religion miss it? 
We are preaching everything else but the kingdom because we have no understanding of what it is. That's the reason for my teaching, to give you understanding, clarity, and wisdom as to what the kingdom. Hi, hi, honey, welcome aboard. So he gave a specific instruction. He says, and as you go, preach or proclaim saying, and here's what you ought to be saying. He even told them what to say. I don't get it how we miss this in our religion because we are basing our understanding based on men and not on God. That's probably why we can't get it. He says, as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Then he says, now, once you proclaim that and you speak that message, then you deliver the message. He said, then said, heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out demons. So as a result of the right message, proclaiming the kingdom, he said the byproduct and the proof of the kingdom is that there should be healing of the sick, cleansing of the leper, raising of the dead, and demons being cast out. Not because we are Christian or because we use Jesus' name. It's because you proclaim the right message. So the right message equals right result. The wrong message equals wrong results. So we are preaching the gospel without the kingdom and we're getting wrong result. Now, this is a word for those who are trapped in the box called religion, thinking that they're good with God and thinking that everything's okay. Yeah, my question is, where's the signs and wonder? And by the way, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what was he, what did he just say? That's what Matthew 4, 17 is where he's quoted also. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's the word missing in here in Matthew chapter 10. Repent there means change your mind, change your thinking. It doesn't mean repent of sin. It means change your mind, change your thinking. For the kingdom. Now, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is not a religion. I keep emphasizing Jesus was not a religious man. I'm going to prove to you he was not religious because the religious people of his day was the one who put him to death. The people who were trapped in the synagogue and the temples, they were the one who accused him and wanted him dead. These were religious people, not the sinners, not the world, religious people who thought they understood the Bible, who claimed Abraham as their father, who followed the law of Moses, who believed in the prophets, and yet Jesus is going to accuse them of being the murderers of the prophets, those sent. And thus his parable is an accusation and a judgment against them when he starts to proclaim them, if you pay close attention. okay. So I'm going to break this down in Matthew chapter 13 when I get there. But I want to set the foundation to show you what all the disciples and Jesus preached. Okay, And as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is hand. The kingdom now is not a religion. The kingdom is a country, a land, or territory ruled by a king. That's the word kingdom. King is the sovereign birth and the power. He's given land as an inheritance and he rules over the land. Within that land is citizens. And he sets rules and regulations pertain how to govern the citizens. So his words when he speaks are laws and decrees from the king. Not open to debate, you must obey them. And so the kingdom is a territorial land ruled by the king. So it's the governing influence of a king over a territory. He influences the territory with his mind, his will, and his intent. Then he chooses, chooses a citizenry or a people group that reflects his nature and his culture. That is a kingdom. That's the territory and land. And the word kingdom is two words. King and dom domain or dominion. That's the two words. King, domain, dominion. You put it together, it's kingdom. That's the word, okay? It's a kingdom of heaven. Heaven now is the abode and dwelling place of God. What he's trying to tell you, the abode and dwelling place of God has now come to dwell amongst men. Now Isaiah comes into play now, right? The God dwell with us. That's the kingdom. He has now come to earth, right? That's the word. So the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Is at hand is an old English term, a word that means it's nearby or close to you or has arrived. That's the word. So when you see it, you got to define your words in your term. Then it says, result of this kingdom, authority, and power coming to earth and is present with you. He said, now the presence of the kingdom, you now the manifestation of that should be healing of the sick, cleansing of the leper, because people had problems. The reason why it's important for us to call the good news that the kingdom has come, because now the sick can be healed. The lepers can be cleansed. The dead can be raised back to life because we were walking in the land of hopelessness. And the demons can be cast out because we felt we had no power, no control over these elements in our world and we just gave into it. But when the kingdom shows up, now there's a chance that now that which seems impossible is now made possible. Now the sick can be made whole because no one wants to be sick. The leper who was cast out from a society who had to go around proclaiming their disease. 
lepers and no one want to be around because they're infectious and they're carrying a disease can now be cleansed and be accepted back into society. The dead, who is dead, we think dead is dead. He dead at the doornail. Ain't no resurrected him. Man, when he dead, stop praying. It's over. Brother going to the worms. Jesus now said, let me tell you something. When the kingdom shows up, the kingdom has the power to bring the dead back to life. Let me show you how it's done. And he brought the dead back to life. The demons who were living in the temple, which is your body, who had no right to be there, he said, you can now cast them out because they are squatters and they're illegal and they're trespassing on the property and the territory of God. So cast them out. Tell these illegal squatters to get out. <laughs> oh! Wow, let's continue. Then it says this. Now this part going to mess some people up and mess those in the church who are collecting the money. He said, let me say something to you you need to know. Since Jesus is the one who comes down from heaven to bring the kingdom, right? And he says, as a result of the kingdom showing up, once you receive it, there's going to be a manifestation of power. The sick will be healed, the leper will be cleansed, the dead raised, and demon cast out. He said, that you did not do of yourself. It is a gift of God. Thus, if it is a gift, freely you have received it. Don't you dare charge anybody for what you didn't go and attain for yourself. God gave you that as a gift. Freely you have received it, freely give it away. For those who are charging for the message of the Bible, know this. God's going to have a problem with you. I know what some of you are saying. You ain't got to like me. I'm not here to be liked or disliked. I'm just telling you. The gift of this knowledge and revelation and the gift of the kingdom doesn't come from man. How dare us charge people for what God has given us for free? It is illegal. That's the reason why I don't need your money. I teach freely because I didn't come up with this on my own. It was revealed to me. I have no right to charge you for what I didn't gain on my own. It was given to me as a gift. And because of the gift, I give away freely. There will be never be a dime I'll take from you for what I give away freely. That's why I teach on here. And you never try and get me to fund my station or go fund me page. And could you send me a contribution? Keep your money to yourself. I don't need it. My source of what I do is not based on man giving me something. The gift that I now give away freely is a gift from God. So he supplies all my need according to his riches. I don't have any lack that I need you to fund for me. Appreciate it. But take your family out. Go take a vacation. Go have a great dinner. I don't need it. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I am not saying... That I'm any better than anybody else. The point I'm trying to make to you, because the Lord has blessed me with the ability to work with my own two hands. And a man who don't work should not be eating. But there are people who are eating, he ain't working because they attribute preaching and teaching, proclamation, to labor. It is a gift and it's an honor to proclaim the word of God. It is not work. It is not labor. That's the misconception we have had. The day you label the ability to teach and preach as work, then a laborer is worthy of his hire. Then you are a hireling. You are not a shepherd. The day you collect a check, you cease to be a disciple and you're not hireling. That's why people are jumping from one green pasture to the other. They go to a certain church, get their health benefit, get their salary. The day they can't pay them, they go to another church. Then what are you, a shepherd? No, because you abandoned the sheep. You are a hireling. Call yourself what you are. I know we justify, well, do, you know, if a man worked for the Lord, should be paid. What about the electric bill? Hey, hey, hey. The Lord never told you to build no building. If you build a building in a church, in an edifice, you want to be paid for, call it what it is. It is your legacy. It ain't God's house. Call it what it is. It is your legacy. Because the name that's put on the building is not God. It's the name of the one who built the building. I'm just saying. He gets the plaque. It's their legacy. It ain't God's house. Because what you need to know, the Bible tells us in Second Peter that everything that man builds with wood, hay, and stubble, one day is going to be tested by the fire. If your building endures that fire, then you can keep it eternally. I promise you this, it won't endure, it will burn up. So this man's structure, it ain't God's house. We need to fix that in our head. So you ain't building God's house, you're building a man's legacy. Alright, let's be honest about it. Alright, let's continue. So he says, the message of the kingdom, the message of the word, didn't come to you, we didn't come up with it on our own. We didn't just came to our head, it came to us. It was a gift freely given. And said, freely you received it. The Lord didn't charge you when he brought the kingdom message. Why are you charging his children? Matthew 17 now comes into play. 
when the man was in the temple, met Jesus and Peter, and said, Does not your master and you pay the temple tax? So maybe go look and you'll see it in Matthew 17. And Peter, the Bible said, Jesus anticipated Peter's answer, Matthew 17, and he walked away into the house. And Peter responded to the man, Yes, we do. We paid the temple tax. Now let me explain to you what the tax was. The tax was money they collected for the upkeep of the building that each one contributed to, right? But you now know if the building don't belong to the Lord, what would he be paying for it, right? Why did he walk away? And I'm going to show you something else you're going to be shocked at. You never paid attention, but I'm going to break it down for you. Peter leaves the man, goes in the house, and the Lord asks him a simple question. And you need to see it for yourself. I see, let me pull it up. I'm going to read it to you so you can see it for yourself. Because as I'm saying things, but I want you to look at it because I want you to do some research for yourself. Uh, just to see, to make sure I'm not telling you something that's not there. <clears throat> let me write this up and see me for a second. I want to read it to you so you can see it for yourself. Oh. <sighs> It's Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27. Matthew 17, verse 24 through 27. So the tax collector from the temple asked Peter whether or not Jesus pays the temple tax prescribed by the Mosaic law. Peter replied, yes, his word. Jesus anticipated his going to respond, yes, and walked away. When Peter entered his house, Jesus asked him if the king's son, his word is, to whom do the kings of the earth charge custom and taxes? He asked Peter. To their sons or to strangers? That was the question Jesus asked him. And Peter responded, to strangers. Then he says this, then the sons are freed then, right Peter? He said, yes Lord. So in other words, if the king charged custom and taxes to strangers because they're not part of his family, doesn't mean that the sons and daughters should not be paying custom and taxes? If the building that they claim to be God's house belongs to God, how does your father charge you to come to his house? Let me put it in a way you would understand it. Parents, mom and dad, do you charge your children to come to your house to pay custom and tax to enter? No. Does your children charge you? Then the sons and daughters because your family is free. Isn't that true? And by the way, let me show you what he did here because remember now, Jesus said something funny. He said, no. Then, then Jesus tells the disciple, neither does anyone own into anything to any collectors. In other words, um, but because he doesn't want them to be offended, Jesus did something very funny most of them pay attention to. He says to Peter, go down to the end of the dock. Cast a fishing line in. And the first fish you catch, open his mouth. There'll be two pieces of corn in his mouth. Give that to the man who collect taxes, lest they be offended. My question to you, did Jesus pay the temple tax on Peter? Or did a stranger call a fish paid it? Remember now, Jesus couldn't violate any of God's commandment. If he paid that money out of his pocket, he'd be violating the law of God because the sons are not required to pay temple tax. Because it's man's structure, it is not God's. He couldn't violate it. So what did he do? He caught a stranger at the end of the dock call a fish and got the fish to pay it not Jesus oh it's important for us to see because when we say oh you're going to tithe really God requires his children to tithe to him I'm just asking the question let's leave that one day I won't touch the tithe and most of you don't want to hear it when you hear the truth about what's going on there but the key I'm trying to get you to understand, freely you receive, freely give. You're not supposed to charge the sons of God to come to God's house. If you're going to claim they belong to God's house, you shouldn't be charging them. Call it what it is. If you want to call the club, call it the man's um, legacy, call it the whatever. There be any of this do, fine, but be honest about it. The building, which they call God's house, have now become a business. Because all we are doing now is collecting our money. Okay, We're using God's name as the catalyst to collect money and put it in our bank account. I'm not sure how we justified it before God, but he just said right here, freely receive the message. If it comes from me, freely give it away. Do not charge. Yet we are charging. Something's off. But we, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go there. You answer to God for that. For those who are listening to me, who may hear this, who are collecting money from the people. All right? You need to deal with this issue. Now, verse nine, love this. And some will probably turn me off after hearing that. I'm done. No problem for me. Provide, he said, now for them, he says, if you're going out and I send you, he said, do not provide for yourself gold or silver. 
In other words, if I'm sending you, it is my responsibility to take care of your need. You ain't got to provide for yourself. Hmm, oh boy, I said it again. It's confirmed what I just said before, isn't it? If the Lord has called you and given you an assignment, whose responsibility is it to take care of you? Yours? No, God's. So he said, it's for them. If you're going to go with this message to present the kingdom to the children of Israel, don't bring in your pocket gold and silver to take care of yourself, nor copper, or any money in your money belt. Don't carry anything. I got you. I sent you. It's my responsibility to take care of the need of my citizen. I am your source. I'm your provider. I, I've shown you in ministry, and Jesus showed you how you can take two fish, five loaves, and multiply. If I'm your source, I'll take care of all you need. Don't provide for yourself. Because the moment you provide for yourself, you don't have to depend on God anymore, do you? You start to rely on your ability, on your ability and strength. Hey, brother, bless. Come on board. Good to have you, Marlon. So if you understand the concept, neither provide gold, nor silver, nor copper in your money belt. Nor bags for your journey, nor tunics, nor sandals, nor staff, for a worker is worthy of his food. In other words, when you come to a home and you present the kingdom message, and if your message makes sense and it hits their heart, their natural response is to give you something to drink and something to eat. I got you. Because your message makes sense and they want to take care of your necessity. It's just how it's done. So for us to be providing for ourselves, we're saying we just don't know when we'll receive my message. But if the Lord sent you, there's provision made for you. He said, don't bring nothing. I got this. You're not there to proclaim yourself. You're presenting the kingdom message to those I'm sending you to. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Verse 11. Now, what sort of city or town you enter, inquire, seek out, in it, who is worthy. Interesting word. Who's worthy. In other words, the word worthiness has to do with those who have a tender ear, tender heart to receive the message you're bringing. And I see this all the time as I start talk to people about kingdom living, who they are, how God made them. Their immediate response is, wow, that just makes sense. Man, you're saying stuff to me I've never heard. And you can see it. They're worthy. If they can receive it. But I'm going to give you a parable we'll talk about later on. Those who are receiving on different ground. We'll discuss this to show you what happens when you bring this message, the kingdom of heaven is in hand, and the soil will fall on. Okay? We'll talk about that later on. He said, inquiring the city who is worthy, and if they finally be worthy, and they can receive it, he said, go into them and stay there till you go out. In other words, present to them your message, the kingdom message, see the transformation, Lead them in the sense of the Lord, the hunger will be stirred and they'll want to hear more until you're ready to go out. But in the process, your needs are taken care of because the people naturally want to take care of you, right? And when you go into a household, greet it. Blessing upon this home. Or greet the people that are there that may be sitting. Could be a mom, it could be a dad, could be two person, one person, but greet it, right? In other words, and if the household is worthy, if they're open to hear when the introduction, I'm bringing to you the kingdom of God, and I'm going to give you more explanation what it is, and they're open to receive it, if the household is worthy, then let your peace that you're carrying of God that's in you, let your peace come upon the home. In other words, no disturbance, no distraction, but the peace of God and the joy come as a byproduct as you start presenting the message, because you don't start to see the light turn on in the life and the light of the people you're talking to and you see the smile on their face and they start to ask you a question and you start to give the answer and you start to see this life that starts to manifest itself. Let the peace come upon the place because your words will bring light and life to the hearer and so your peace will remain there. But if the place is not worthy, in other words, you came to present the kingdom, they want to hear it but they reject it. He said, let your peace return back to you. Here now is very important for us to realize. You cannot force upon people what they don't want to hear or want to receive. It is their right to not want to hear it, to reject it. They're given a choice. So if the place is not worthy, let your peace return to you and let your peace <clears throat> and let your peace come upon it. Right? I'm sorry, I'm going to go back a little bit. Let the peace return to you, verse 14. And whosoever will not receive you nor hear your words. What words? The kingdom of heaven, right? Not the gospel. Very important word. The message Jesus gave and preached the kingdom. Tell them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's the word. Very important for you to understand. Not the gospel without the kingdom. 
Okay? But the kingdom message is the good news. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So if they will not receive you, nor hear your words, which is the kingdom, then you depart from that house uh, or that city. Then on the way out, shake off the dust from your feet. Why are you doing that? I surely say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Because they reject the kingdom message, they're under condemnation. The only hope of salvation for mankind is the kingdom. I get it. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We'll talk about it later on. That we are preaching Jesus. Right? Jesus, 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 Jesus. Come to Jesus. Get saved by Jesus. When Jesus told you, don't preach Jesus. Hmm. People come to Jesus. Many are stuck at the door of Jesus. And they never enter past Jesus. When he said the message isn't Jesus, the message is the kingdom. And what's in the kingdom? My Father. I am the doorway to get you to him. Do not bring people to me, but bring people through me. You can't go see my Father because of the doorway of the kingdom. I'm the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to my Father, which is the kingdom, lest he come through, not to. So we're stuck at Jesus and we're preaching Jesus. The good news is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Yet Jesus is going to tell you, if I preach me, my message ain't true. You're going to find out the disciples never preached Jesus. I'll show it to you and you can make your own judgment. But what we are preaching is not the right message. I said before, if you start with your wrong concept, you're going to end up with all the wrong conclusion. That's why change of your mind, change your thinking is so important for you to get to the right concept. And the reason I'm setting this up before I get to Matthew chapter 13 is so you know exactly what the instruction, the command, and the message of Jesus was. If he's going to be your standard, he's got to be your standard all the way through the scripture. You cannot pick a point where you follow Jesus and next you follow man. You're going to make a decision. If man is right, then follow him. If God is right, follow him. It's a choice we face with, with Elijah, with a prophet of Baal or God. If Baal be God, serve him. If God be God, serve him. But make up your mind. We are following men on the instruction. And if the man got the wrong instruction because he has the wrong concept, then all his conclusion may not be right. You may be think you're good with God, but you may not be in a good position. You may think you are. Blessed is the man who put his trust in Lord. Cursed is the man who put his trust in man. So we have to make a decision. Which way are we going to go? Let me continue. So it says here, he used, I sure say to you, for the person who reject the word of the kingdom, right? He said, It'll be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, which now was burned up with, with fire and brimstone, and the judgment, judgment than for that city. If he destroyed them, the word came, they rejected it, but their judgment and punishment be far less than what these people receive because they reject the only hope of salvation is the kingdom. I'm going to show you scripture, Matthew chapter 24, 14. We'll talk about it later on, about the only message that's delaying his return is they're preaching the wrong message. Let's continue. Mark chapter 1, verse 30, verse 14. Mark 1, 14. To show you what he preached. Mark 1, 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching, what did he preach? The gospel of the kingdom. Do you see it there? So you're going to understand now in the book of Acts when it is used from the gospel. And his other passage when Jesus tells them, I'll go preach the gospel. They all knew he was talking about the kingdom. Because they didn't, it's a short form of the kingdom by saying the gospel. Everyone knew the good news was the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Understand? It's the same idea I keep using over and over again. When we use U.S. versus United States of America. We don't use the long form, we use the short form. Because we're a part of America, and everyone in America know when you use the word U.S., you're talking about the United States of America. Same principle being applied here. When you use the gospel, everyone knows it's the gospel of the kingdom. Thus, they use the short form called the gospel. So when you use the gospel, Jesus preached the gospel. Yes, he did. What was the gospel? The kingdom. Right? He just told you. Matthew 4, 1, 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee, Preaching or proclaiming the gospel, the good news. Here's the of we keep missing. For those in religion, pay attention. For those of you who are preaching the gospel without the kingdom, you're missing it. You cannot have good news without telling what the good news is. The good news isn't the healing. The good news isn't the deliverance. The good news isn't salvation. That's a byproduct of the kingdom. The good news, the kingdom out of that comes. The healing, the deliverance, the salvation, the promise, the blessing. All that you want comes out of the right message being preached. So the good news is not healing. It's a byproduct of the kingdom presence. 
Demon being cast out is not the good news. It's a byproduct of the presence of the kingdom. The blind eyes being opened is not the good news. It's the byproduct of the kingdom presence. The demons being cast out, the dead race is all a byproduct of the kingdom presence. That's why Jesus didn't magnify any of those natural manifestation because that's just the byproduct of the kingdom presence. He never glorified raising the dead. He didn't build a ministry on it, spitting a man's eye, multiplying two fish, five loaves. It's the manifestation of the kingdom presence. What he magnified was the Father and the presence of the kingdom with you. That's what he magnified. So Matthew chapter 14 tell one fourteen tells you he preached the gospel of the kingdom. That statement is pretty plain. Jesus preached the gospel about the kingdom of God. Pretty plain, right? How much clearer can it be? And I still can't get it how we still not seeing it today. But I know why. Seeing this and they see what they want. Hearing this and they hear, but they don't hear. That's what the fathers told them, right? The Jews, the Pharisees told them. We see, we hear. He said, because you say you see, you're blind. Because you say you hear, you're deaf. So most are seeing, but they ain't seeing. Hearing, but they're not hearing. Still happening today, folks. Still happening today. So the question becomes, which side of it are you on? Do you see or do you hear? Hmm. Question. Let's continue. Luke chapter 40 to Luke chapter 4, verse 42. Luke 4, verse 42. Jesus' response was, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. Number, there's only two purposes Jesus came to the planet. To die for sinners. No, that's the stop he had to make. Here's the purpose. One of the purposes he came is so that the kingdom of God will be preached to other cities, right? Who was the other cities? The cities of the Samaritan and the Gentiles, the Jewish cities. But later on, Paul came and preached, present the message to the Gentile. So the purpose was to incorporate Gentile in the promise of Abraham because of his obedience. Now the Gentile had a chance to enter into the kingdom living. So the message had to be preached. So the purpose number one that came was to preach the message to those cities and to the Gentile be incorporated. First purpose. For this purpose was the Son God, God manifest. Number one, to destroy the work of the devil. Two purposes came. Destroy the work of the devil, preach the kingdom to the Jews and all the Gentiles to bring them into kingdom living. That's the two reason why Jesus came. To die on the cross is not the reason he came. That's a part of the process in the purpose. He had to meet those requirements to meet the standards so the purpose would be manifested. Death on the cross is one of the stops he had to make. Dying and going to hell was the stop he had to make. Two fish, five loaves. The woman at the well was stopped he had to make. But that's not the purpose why he came. It was in the plan. The purpose he came was to destroy the work of the devil, take the kingdom authority, take keys of death and hell from the devil, give you and I your dominion power back, and then present the message to incorporate the Gentiles into the promise of Israel so we too can be saved as a remnant that he set aside for himself. But in that purpose was the plan to make this specific stop at certain places that certain event would take place. That's a part of the plan to manifest the purpose. Help us, Lord. Help us. Help us. Hmm. So that's the reason. Only two purposes came. So when you want to know what Jesus came here for, he didn't come to die for no sinners. He had to make a stop. That's a part of the plan of God. He had to die for sinners. God purposed that in the plan. As part of the purpose, the plan was the part of that to manifest the purpose. That's why. So he had to stop and die on the cross. He died to save sinners. That's a requirement of God. He had to shed his blood. That was a part of the plan to manifest the purpose. Okay? So do you understand? Jesus said that one of his primary purpose for coming to earth was to preach about the kingdom of God. That was his gospel. Let me say it again. Jesus said, one of the his primary purpose for coming to earth was to preach about the kingdom of God. That was his good news. The kingdom of God has come to earth. That was his message. He didn't deviate. He didn't change. He kept it the same. That was his purpose. That is what drove and motivated him. He had a purpose to fulfill. I said before, there are three things we're here to do. You and I be designed with an identity, a purpose, and a destiny. Within that three areas, there is plans, appointments, plus stops, people, influences built into it to manifest those things. But the key to manifesting your authority, you have to know who you are. You have to have an identity. You cannot call yourself a religious name. So if you don't know who you are, then people can influence who you are. And they try to make you to their image. You have to have a purpose. Right? You have an identity 
and you have a destiny. Your destiny was your design for what you should manifest on the earth before you die and leave. So you have your identity, you have your destiny, and you have your purpose. The purpose is originally intent for why you were created to manifest it. So if you understand those three put together, it makes sense to why you're here. No life on is here on the planet by accident. Every life has a purpose, an identity, and a destiny built within them. God made sure of that, just like Jesus, to fulfill it before you leave the planet. That's why when people die, there's always a fear in their heart and mind. Is, did I do what God created me to do? If you don't manifest purpose, then you're sucking up air and you're not manifesting anything. Naturally, when you don't have identity, you don't have purpose, and you don't know your destiny, we'll naturally spend our life spinning our wheel trying to find those things. And that's why people are self-destructing. Self-destructing. What are they doing? They're experimenting and trying things, trying to find these three basic things in their life. They want identity. They want to find their purpose and the meaning to life. And they'll naturally do weird things to find that. Some are very involved in drinking, drugs, alcohol, promiscuity is a sign, a search for meaning. Because everything that you are going to become come out of your identity. If you don't know who you are, you will self-implode. So you need to know who God made you to be. You got to be very comfortable. God didn't make a mistake with you. You've been designed with a purpose and a destiny. Once you find that, you can be in the world and not be of the world because they cannot paint you into a corner. Naturally, as a black man, they're trying to call me a black man. But I discovered a long time ago because I know who I am. I am not a black man. I am a man, and a man, according to Genesis 126, is not a human. It is a spirit. So I am a spirit who's wearing a black suit. So please don't mix up my black suit with my who I am. This is just my pigmentation, my humus. It is not who I am. So what I am on the outside is not who I am on the inside. So many times when people try to label you, if you like identity, then you'll be labeled into being a minority or being a black or Hispanic or labeling they're using. That's a human concept. But it's not a biblical one. Your pigmentation is not who you are. That's why the Lord told you, when you die, you're humus or your suit, the world is going to eat it, and the world won't care whether you're black, white, blue, or green. He'll eat you the same way. <laughs> so for us to get caught up, I'm white, I'm black, I'm a little half this, I'm a mix that. You get caught up in the wrong thing. When you find your identity, they can't block it the corner, label you as being black or white or blue. I am a spirit made in the image of God. Seated in heaven place and in Christ. I am the image and the reflection of God. So you cannot lower me down to my suit. My suit is too low. That's earthy. That makes me legal on the planet. But I'm not my suit. I wear the suit so I can function in life. To breathe, to move and have function. But I'm not my suit. So don't mix up my identity with my suit. I wear the suit. And I like my suit by the way. I like me in the suit. But it's not who I am. Because I know one day this suit must go back from the dirt from which it came. All right? So don't get so caught up in your dirt suit. All right? So I just want to give you that to break everything out so you understand where we're going with this. So we now see the primary purpose of Jesus coming to earth was to present the kingdom of God. Right? He He's the one who was he the qualified one to do that. He's the only one who came, came down from heaven to do that. None of us have been up to heaven to bring it down. So when you pray, right? Matthew chapter 6. Our Father, Lord in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Right? Which of you gone to heaven to bring the kingdom down? None. There's only one who came from heaven to bring the kingdom down. That was Jesus who's gone back up. So when you were when you pray in Matthew chapter six, thy kingdom come, with the word come there doesn't mean come from heaven. Because the kingdom of God is not in heaven. That's the headquarters, yes. That's a part of the territory, that's the headquarters. But the kingdom of God that he brought is here on earth. And here's what Jesus said. Summed up the kingdom in simple form for you to understand it. What is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is this. Summed up in the simplest form. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Next question. Where is the Holy Spirit dwelling? In heaven or in you? In you. Thus, when you pray thy kingdom come, if it's dwelling within you, the kingdom of God shall be with you in the form of Jesus, and it shall be in you. So the kingdom of God's already in you. So when you pray the word come there, it doesn't mean come down from heaven in Matthew chapter 6. It means come from inside of you. You if you're a follower of Christ who have accepted and walked in righteousness are the carrier of God's kingdom called the Holy Spirit that you pray for him to come out from us inside of you out 
to take territory and expand the territory of God's kingdom on the earth. He said, the place my will is not being done is on the earth. So you pray that my king will come on earth through you. Misconception again. My God, how many times I heard that prayer pray verbatim and they interpret it wrong because we have a misconception. So the word thy kingdom come doesn't mean come from heaven. Thy kingdom come from inside of me. If I'm the carrier of the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. In heaven? In the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit? In heaven? Or is it in you? I'm just saying. I think you can figure that one out. Let's continue. When we understand the thrust of Jesus' message was about the kingdom of God, we understand better why he made the statement in Matthew 6.33. Do you remember Matthew 6.33? We talk about Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6.33 says, and by the way, there's another misconception I keep repeating over and over again in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. You've heard it said. And I guarantee it. And I know that I know that I know this has been said over and over again. This is where you tell the Lord what you need. Give us this day our daily bread. It is called the Lord's Prayer. Nowhere do you and I have the right to interject your need into the Lord's Prayer. It ain't called your prayer. It ain't called your mama's prayer. It ain't called your daddy's prayer. It's called the Lord's prayer. That means the only thing that should be in that prayer is his will, his purpose, his intent, not yours. But the church has convinced us and give us this day our daily bread. And because they never took the time to study out what daily bread is. Daily bread ain't a loaf of bread you buy the store slice and put some butter on and eat it. <laughs> oh, God help us. Oh. <sighs> Give us every day a slice of bread. Are we serious? Come on now. Somewhere along now we got to get this, get this studying this thing. Study to show yourself approved. We need to stop being ignorant and stop being blind, being misled. The word daily bread, when you study that in the Hebrew, means everything pertaining to life and godliness. So when he says, give us this day our daily bread in Matthew chapter 6, it means give us every day everything that you can grant to us pertaining to a functionality which means life and a Christ attribute or likeness. That's the word daily bread. It is not food, clothing, nor shelter. Thus Matthew 6.33. Why does he emphasize 6.33? He says if you need stuff or you want stuff, all you have to do is Matthew 6.33. Seek first my kingdom. First means priority. You want things? You want supply, food, clothing, shelter? It is my Father. It's my good pleasure to give it to you. But in order to get it, you got to seek. Seek means set your mind and heart in a specific direction for a specific cause. Seek first, priority, God's kingdom. Now, why does he ask you to seek the kingdom, not stuff? Because within the kingdom is his Father. And the Father is the one you want favor with who supplies all you need. And when you seek the Father's will, his heart, not his hand, he supplies you with your need. So seek first priority the kingdom of God. And he said on top of that, don't come to me as a crooked, corrupt person, but and seek first the kingdom and is his righteousness. By the way, righteousness is not a church terminology. It is actually a court of law terminology. Hmm. Let me break it down for you in the Hebrew culture what righteousness was. We define the word as being right standing with God, or walking upright is the word we use, right? That's which is correct. In the court of law in the Hebrew time, when they took a man to court, if you're accused of a crime and they took you to court and they brought witnesses in that proved that you were guilty. And in the Hebrew culture, you had to bring at least two or three witnesses, right? Not just one. If you bring one witness, it's called he say, see, she say, right? It's your word against there. That's not strong enough to prove you guilty or innocent. If you bring two, now you have corroborating in the court of law. It's called corroborating evidence. That basically means he say, she say, but one comes to corroborate what you said. So now you have two or three is a slam dunk, right? So you bring three witnesses. And if you're found to be guilty, they would label you unrighteous. So it's a court terminology. That's why when you stand before God, you will not be standing in a church. You'll be standing in the courtroom of heaven. Oh my God, when are we going to hear these words and pay attention? You will not be in a church or a sanctuary when you get to heaven to be judged whether you're good or evil. You'll be in the court of law. Jesus, God will be the judge. His son is the prosecutor or the defense attorney. 
And there are three witnesses in the court of heaven. The water, the spirit, and the blood. Pay attention. So you're not going to stand in some chat somewhere where the board gets to vote whether you're in or you're out. You're going to stand before the just judge in the courts of heaven. Very important word for you to pay attention to. So when you see Matthew 6.33, Seek first my kingdom, walk in righteousness. Then he said, when you meet the standard of seeking the kingdom, which is the presence in the face of God, when you see God's face in his heart, his hand moves naturally. And you walk in righteousness. He said, you need to know you have what your petition. And here's what you need to know. You don't have to ask him or tell him. He said, I already know what you have need of before you even ask me. When you meet the standard of the kingdom, you walk in righteousness. He said, I'll just naturally add all these things unto you. I'm a parent too. Just like your parents provide for you without asking, you don't have to ask me. Trust me, I have your best interests at heart and it's my job to supply all your needs according to my riches. Just like a child never asks when it's born for the mom to buy the little girl a pink dress or little boy a blue outfit or little socks, a little shoe, a little booty, they did that naturally. They couldn't talk. They only do three things. Eat, sleep, and poop. That's all they did. And yet the parents supplied their need without asking. He said, if you being evil know how to do that, how much will the Heavenly Father do for you? I'm a parent too. So if you're seeking for what the Gentiles seek after, all these things he said the Gentiles seek after because they have no faith in God. But if you are a son of God, it is the father's responsibility of the parent to supply the need of his children. So if you are my children, I got your back. Why are you asking me for stuff I already determined to give to you? It's my responsibility. In case you doubt me, look at the fields. Look at the birds. <laughs> I'm just, oh, there's so much example the Lord gives you to get you to understand that's his responsibility to take care of his children. So Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. He tells us to seek first the kingdom of God because at the center of the kingdom is the king, his father, who is the source supply and power for every need that arise in the daily lives of kingdom citizens. It is the responsibility of the king to take care of the need of all his citizens. Not ours to supply itself. In the kingdom of God, the king take care of his citizens. Let me say this. Christians who seek to follow Jesus Christ's footsteps should make the kingdom of God as high priority in their lives as it was in Christ's life. Let me say it again. Christians. Why do I use that word? I very rarely use it, but I use it. Because many has identified themselves with Jesus as Christians. So let me say this to all the Christians that's hearing me. That has that title attached. As a Christian. Which is not a biblical term that Jesus used, by the way. You cannot use that name before the Lord. Because you weren't labeled that by him. However, some will hold on to it till they die. The word Christian came in an Antioch where we were labeled by pagans who worship idols, Diana, Diana, Zeus, Hera, and they had Aphrodite, all those names from the Greek mythology. So Christians who received that name, who claim to follow Jesus, because the word Christian, as we've been told, means to be Christ-like, right? And my simple question is this, are most Christian Christ-like? Hmm. Or they like flesh like. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying. But the idea Christian who seek to follow Jesus Christ's footsteps should make the kingdom of God a high priority in your life. Question. What is the priority Christian in your life today? The gospel or the kingdom? You need to answer that. Is the gospel the priority that you're seeking the gospel? You're preaching the gospel? Or is the kingdom the priority? And I'm speaking here to teachers, to preachers, Sunday school teachers, preachers, rabbi, bishop. I'm talking to all of y'all. What is your priority? What are you preaching? Are you preaching the gospel? If you preach the gospel without the kingdom, you can interpret what the gospel means. Healing, deliverance. Transformation, devil worship, name and life, vibe and spirit, and all the names that we're doing. See, so we put any type of label, when you understand the concept, you're going to put all kind of meaning in there, what's supposed to mean. But if you preach the gospel without the kingdom, your priority is off. And that's why most of your message don't make sense to the people. Or they won't tell you, but I'll tell you. If you preach a message out your head of something you have discovered as a title, and you don't explain to them what you're actually thinking and give them an example of it as what it means and how to work it out, they don't come up with their own concept. 
So in most services being preached Sunday morning, if there is a title of a message, and at the end of the service, you take a survey to ask the people what the message was. If you have 500 people, 500 different concepts. That means your message didn't make no sense. Because they heard definitely what you said. Because they're filtering, filtering through their filter, aren't they? So make sure if you make a statement, you not only have to make the statement, define it, give an example of it, and give the meaning of it, and so they know exactly what you said without guessing. Because if they guess, they're going to interpret it wrong. I think, here's the word I use, I think he said, I believe he said, or I felt he meant. Have you heard these words? I think you have. So you got to be very clear when you make a statement. Make sure they can't read your mind. So make sure when you speak your mind, which is a thought out your head, come out your mouth, you got to define it. Not only say it, define your meanings of your words, give an example of it, so they know exactly what you said. Okay? Just helping you out a little bit there. So a Christian who seeks to follow Jesus Christ's footsteps should make the kingdom of God a high priority in their lives as it was in Christ's life. If Jesus is our example and Jesus only preached the kingdom, for a Christian, your priority should be the kingdom, not the gospel. The kingdom should be message because that was a priority of his life. Before he died and when he resurrected, the kingdom was a priority again and all the disciples preached it. Jesus came to set us an example of how he lived. And if he's our example, we should both follow the example. Isn't that correct? He then died for our sins and was resurrected so we can have an opportunity to be in his kingdom. Hear the word? So he paid the ultimate sacrifice so you're not going to be in the kingdom so we can start to get into kingdom living. The problem we're having in most of the church preaching about the kingdom is that they're looking for the future to sweep by and by or down the road. What I'm trying to teach you now is that you can live in kingdom living now. We now know, based on the book of Revelation, in heaven there will be no sorrows, no heartache, no pain, no tears. None of this stuff will be there. So if the kingdom of God is in heaven, you wait to enter, that means throughout life you're going to live in sorrow and all the heartache and the pain, right? So why did Jesus come if the goal of his coming was to get you to go to heaven to meet the peace and joy and rest? I think he said, I came that you may have life and life more abundantly. And I thought he said he want to have life abundantly here and now, not in heaven. So why are we trying to go to heaven to get it when kingdom living is now? You and I are supposed to overcome and have an abundant life here and now. In heaven there will be no sorrows, no heartache, no pain, no lack. Okay? So the whole idea of the kingdom wouldn't be for heaven. It's for you and me to live in it now and overcoming life. Understand your purpose, your identity, your destiny. Live and overcoming life here in the earth. I have come to give you life, the ability to function in life by your obedience to my laws and commandment. I send you a helper when? In heaven? No, now. To lead you and guide in all truth. When in heaven? No, here on the earth. Now. Okay? We are pushing off in the future what should be living today. You gotta, this is our training ground for the eternal living and kingdom living and the authority and power will be given in heaven. This is our practice ground. So now is when we need to live in King Limit, overcoming life, to demonstrate to the world that there's a higher standard and a better way of living. And it's got to be not what we tell them, it's by how we live. I don't tell people. I live it around them. Let them see for themselves, and they can come to their conclusion on their own. Okay? Let's continue. So we now see it. So Jesus is the example. He then died for our sins and was resurrected so we can have an opportunity to be in the kingdom of God. Everything Jesus did during his earthly ministry ultimately led to the kingdom of God. Are we seeing this? Yet most have read this, paid no attention. That is why he summarized his message by calling it the gospel of the kingdom. Who said it? Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus is your Lord? Are you going to believe his word or are you going to deny it? We can run all we want to, you can't deny it. He said it. So you're going to believe his word? If his word brings you life, then you have to believe all his word. Either it is right or it's wrong. There's no in between. You can't pick and choose when you believe or don't believe. So in other words, the problem we're having now is not we don't believe. is that our concept, our mind, and what we're being told is in error. So in order for us to change the way we think and believe Jesus, you have to be willing to change your mind, change your thinking. The example of this is if you are driving to Florida and somebody gave you instruction to get on 95, but never told you north or south, and you decide when you got to 95 to turn north, right? Well, you're on the path and the instruction you're given. Go on 95. 
But he never told you north or south. So you made a decision to go north. Let me say something you need to know. I don't care how much you pray, you fast, how much you give. If you're heading 95 north, you ain't getting to Florida. You're not going to get there because you're heading to Canada. You will end up in Canada because you're on the wrong path. So what do you need to do to fix the problem? You have to stop, pause, change your mind, change your thinking, turn around, and then you get to your destination. Now that's the word, repent. Change your mind, change your thinking, turn around. If you're preaching and living the gospel life without the kingdom, you're heading in the wrong direction. You've got to stop, pause, change your mind, change your thinking, and turn around. That's the whole idea. That's what the message is trying to tell you. Repent, change your mind, change your thinking. Because the law, the day he told the Pharisees, the day of the law and the prophets are over. The kingdom of heaven has now arrived. So you got to change your mind, change your thinking, change the way you think. Because you're no longer going to live by the law and prophet anymore. All the law and the prophet is fulfilled in the first two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said, all of the law and prophets summed up into love. Once you got those two mastered, you fulfill all the requirement of the law. Gary didn't say it. Jesus did. Okay? So we're going to believe Jesus, believe him all that he said. <clears throat> Let's continue. Here's a question. How did Christianity, Christianity, lost Jesus' message. How did they do it? What happened? When did they miss it? What happened? Well, I say it this way. Let me sum it very quickly for you and I'm going to get into how they lost it. The Satan, the devil, was very slick and very smart. He was there when God created man. He was there in the garden, according to this book of Genesis. He was there. He's the one, Bible, by the way, in the Bible, asking, what is man that thou art mindful of him? You made the Lord the angel and you did put all that you have made with your hand on his dominion. He's the one asking the question. So he was there when God made man. He understood what God made man for. Men was designed and created to be just like the angel. Worship God in obedience, not break his commandment. So he was there when God made man. He also knew that man was created to worship and to serve God. So what he did was, he said, well, I can't stop man from worshiping. I can't stop God, man from serving. However, I can mess up mankind if I can get him to believe in a half truth versus the whole truth, the full truth, and nothing but the truth. So what he did was he convinced mankind to start teach something called the gospel without the kingdom, a half truth. There's truth. Remember, the best lies told amongst a bunch of truth, right? The best lies are told amongst a bunch of truth. The word is truth. But if I can take the word and manipulate it to give you only a half truth, you'll never know that there's a full truth and you'll operate based on the half you have. Thus Christianity comes to play. That's where they're operating. And that's why you don't see a lot of power demonstration. They're not leading the world. They're struggling at the world. They're sick like the world. All this stuff that are happening should not be happening because we have been lied to. The devil is very subtle in what he did. So how did Christianity lose their way? After Christ was resurrected and ascended to heaven, he founded a church. Remember that? Jesus founded a church. However, the purpose of that church, the word church there is the word ekklesia in the Greek. Ekklesia. And the word ekklesia means called out group of people, not a building or location. So he, the church he founded, that's what he told Peter, who do men say that I am? Most of you remember the story. And he says, Peter says, he said, Peter, who do men say that I am? He says, some say you're a prophet, some say you're Moses, some say you're Elijah, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter responds, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus responded to Peter, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father, which is in heaven. And he said, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. You'll be called Cephas or Peter the rock. Now, based on that statement, Jesus was basically trying to say, when people read that statement, if you read it on the surface without defining the term and the word, you naturally think he told Peter, I'm going to build a building and you're going to be the first Pope or Rabbi, which is what they interpreted, right? Christianity, in this case, the Roman culture interpreted that he wanted a building with rocks in it. But the idea of the revelation was Jesus said to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father which is in heaven. So the word there, I will build my church, called out separated people, called out by God, Based on revelation that he is the Christ. I will build my church based on revelation. Those who are called out. They'll be revealed to them the mystery of the kingdom of God. Right? That's what the word is trying to tell them. And the church, there was no building location. 
upon the rock is the rock is the foundation of the revelation that Peter got. Because at that time, the only way Peter would have known who Christ was, the Father had to reveal it to him. So that's the rock on that revelation. He'll build a church that the gates of hell won't prevail against because it's based on revelation, based on truth, your identity, your purpose. So the devil will not prevail against you. The problem we're having in Christianity, the devil's prevailing because they don't know who they are. They're not operating based on revelation. They're based on their think, feel, or believe. It's not good. It is not good. Thus, the devil is prevailing. But the church that Jesus founded, the gates of hell won't prevail because we operate in authority and power to overcome situations and circumstances, to control our environment, control our words, understand our authority, know who we are, know how sin works. That's why I've been teaching on the kingdom to show you the power level you should be operating. You should be no more, no less than Jesus. You have the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demon, walk on water, multiply two fish, five loaves. All those miracles wasn't for Jesus. It was for you and me to show you your power level, not his. His will is done in heaven. The only place is not being done. Does he come to be the second Adam to show the sons of Adam what they should operate like and what the standards are by the standard of God? That's what it's all about. Let's continue. So we now see the purpose of that church that he built, called that group of people, was to carry on the work he did while here on earth. Christ commissioned his church to called out people to go into the entire world. If the church is the building, how can the church, the building, get up and walk it into the world? So we now know the church ain't no building. Okay? So we need to just settle that part and get that out of our head. Well, brother, where do you fellas? Which church you go to? It ain't a church called a gathering, called a club. It ain't God's house. God don't dwell in building made with hands. He ain't there. The day you leave, he leave. You and I are God's church. When you're there, he shows up. When you're not, he's not. I'm sorry. Most of you don't want to hear, but let's tell you the truth. Christ commissioned his church to go into all the entire world and preach the same message that he preached while he is here on earth. The good news of the kingdom. Thus he gives you scripture. Matthew 24, 14. Remember, say before I tell you what's holding him up. And this gospel... Of the kingdom shall be preaching all the world for a witness unto all nation, and then the end will come. When will the end come? When the gospel is preached or when the kingdom is preached? I'm just saying, pay attention. Look at the scripture. And this gospel of, of mean there is more, the kingdom shall be proclaimed to all the world for a witness, evidence, proof against them. Now, once the witness and the evidence spoken, they can receive it or reject it. And if they reject it, the witness will still testify against them. If they accept it, then the kingdom will come to manifest itself. So Matthew 24, 14. That's the command of scripture for Christians. You need to know what's holding the Lord from coming back. He has not come back for over 2,000 years because we have preached the gospel without the kingdom. The kingdom message has not reached the end of the earth yet. So if the, we're saying now in the churches that the gospel has reached the end of the earth, why has not the Lord returned? <laughs> because he just told you right here. It is not the gospel that needs to be preached. It's the kingdom that needs to be preached as a witness. Once you preach the kingdom, his return will be immediate. So you want to come back fast? Start to preach the kingdom. I'm just saying, check it out. You want him to come back tomorrow? Go ahead, get on the world. Get to preach the kingdom. Present that message to the world. And then the end will come. He said, that's what's holding me up. You have an assignment. And until you complete the assignment, I can't come back. Just like it was the day of Noah. He could not send the flood till the ark was finished. He cannot come back till you preach the message. Noah's given assignment. You and I are given assignment. Noah's assignment, build the ark. Save the animal two by two. The day he finished it, the flood came. So what held up the judgment? Noah did. Who determined when the judgment came? Noah did. The righteous man determines when the Lord returned, not the wicked. So the concept that we're looking at the world and look at the wicked say, because they're doing these weird things, same-sex marriage, abortion, da 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 we think that's a sign of his return. It is not. It is not the wicked that gets to determine when the Lord returned. It's the assignment and the completion of the assignment of the righteous. Preach the kingdom. You want to come back by in two years? Get online, start presenting the kingdom message. 
But I now know it'll take longer because it takes a while for the kingdom message to sink in, for your mind to be renewed and be transformed. Okay? But that's what's holding him up. Not because he don't want to come back. Not because he don't want to fix these problems. He will. But he needs us to preach the right message. Because the world must be given a chance and every nation must be given a chance to step into the kingdom. If they reject it, then they'll help this judgment. If they receive it, they can be welcomed in. That's the key. Let's continue. Next verse. To show you how we lost it. Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20. Matthew 28, verse 19 through 20. Hmm. Go therefore, he gave the commandment, and make disciples of all nations. He didn't say converts. He said disciples. Disciples takes three to three and a half years to convert to become a disciple. Three to three and a half years to make a disciple. Okay? Just to let you know. <laughs> Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So he says... Go on, therefore, make disciples. In other words, the proclamation, the command I read to you earlier, he gave a command, and when you go, preach his message. What was the message? The kingdom of heaven is at the hand, right? So go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Those who receive it, let your peace remain. Those who reject it, wipe the dust off your feet. So you're going to go to all the nations and do the same thing. What you're proclaiming? The kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? And then if they receive it, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you instruct them by discipleship. And you now, you just don't save them and let the babies stay out there. Talk about save my Walmart. And I don't know if they're going to church. You know, but they accepted Jesus. He said, now teach them. That means you now have a responsibility to instruct them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That takes time. The day you lead the person to Christ and you lead them in the sinner's prayer, you're basically telling God, I'm ready to disciple them. And you have three to three and a half years to teach them how to walk with God. Walk in righteousness, walk in obedience, in knowledge, wisdom, understanding. And you lay them when you're in the three and a half years. You put them in the hand of the Spirit. who will lead them and guide them in all truth. And the Holy Spirit shall be with them to the end. Discipleship takes time. So if you're not ready for discipleship, stop trying to force salvation on people who are not ready for it. Because they're going to self-destruct and become an enemy of the cross because we force them when they're not ready. Just like you and I have to have a choice to follow God, you must give them the same option. That's why in your New Testament throughout the Bible, you never saw Jesus force anyone to accept him. They must make the decision on their own and come to him and call him Lord. And then they were saved. He never forced anybody. Why are we doing it? Hmm. Let's continue. Mark 6.15. Mark 6.15. Here's another command. He said to them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all nations and all creation. And in Acts 1, verse 3 through 8, Acts 1, verse 3 through 8, after his suffering, he presented himself to them, um, to speak about Jesus, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proof that he was alive. Speaking of Jesus, he appeared to them over a, over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom, not the gospel. Jesus resurrected, spent about 40 days, and the only message he preached was about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of, of gift of my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God shall now come and dwell within you, and the king will lead you and guide you in all truth and shall be with you to the end. That's the Holy Spirit. Acts 1, verse 3 through 8, that's it. And it continues. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? Notice what he's going to restore to Israel. Notice what they're asking for. Not the church, not the temple, not the synagogue. They said, are you now going to restore the kingdom back to Israel? So my question is, why are they asking if he was a religious man to restore a kingdom when kingdom and religion have nothing to do with each other? But if he's a king, then he has the power to restore a kingdom. Oh, so could it be that Jesus is a king and not a religious man? And that's what they ask him about. Yeah, he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and not the real religion, as we've thought. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the season the Father set in his own authority. The season and the time. But you, he says, but you. In other words, you're looking for a king to be established in Israel. But he says, I'm more concerned about you. It's about you now. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit come upon you. What's the source of, that's the word grace. The Holy Spirit brings with him the power, the enablement, and the strength. Mm. But you shall receive power, the authority, and the right 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And as a result of that power and enablement and strength, you shall be my witnesses, one who brings proof or evidence in Jerusalem where your locale is, in Judea, the surrounding town, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. But in order for you to be the witness, you need the power. You need the authority, you need the right. Jesus delegated that to the disciples, but now the manifestation of it would occur when they received the power. As a byproduct of that delegation of power, they became bold. They weren't afraid of the Pharisees, nor the Sadducees, nor the teacher of the law, nor the different one who attacked them. And they were so bold in their faith that the Pharisees were shocked as then when they figured out that these men were uneducated and unlearned it, and the only conclusion they could come to that they had been with Jesus. How could they conclude that? Because the greatest honor of a disciple is to become the teacher. So their words reflect Jesus. That's why they knew they had been with him, because they sounded and acted just like him. How do you get it? That's the point. Wow, I'm running out of time. Let me read one more, one more section here. I got two minutes. The Bible shows that the early church faithfully followed Christ's directive and preached the gospel of the kingdom of God according to Acts chapter 8, verse 12. I'm going to give you the verses here. I'm not going to read them out to you. Acts 8, verse 12. Acts 14, verse 22. Acts 19, 8. Acts 20, verse 25. Acts 28, verse 23 and 31. The members of the early church also put their focus on the coming kingdom according to Colossians chapter 4 verse 11 and Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. Okay, so you need to understand what was happening in the early church. The Bible shows that the early church faithfully followed Christ's directive, preached the gospel of the kingdom of God, and these verses support that they did. And they were being persecuted for it, by the way. And in Colossians, the members of the early church also put their focus on the coming kingdom because they knew it was coming. Um, but this is in Colossians chapter 4 verse 11 and 2 Thessalonians 1 5. I'm sorry, I said, I said Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians verse 1 through 5. All right, should I continue? Let me read one more. But as the first century church progressed, the intense focus on the kingdom began to wane. As false belief began to creep into Christianity, the Apostle Paul wrote that he perceived Christians in his time were turning away from the true gospel to a different gospel according to Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. So right here, within the structure of men, they start to turn away from the kingdom to now make the gospel the message and they turn away from the true one to the false one. And what was like it in his final letter, Paul gave multiple warning about his fear that people were abandoning, abandoning, abandoning the true gospel and the true doctrine and being led astray with false teaching. According to 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 18, 2 Timothy 3, 13 through 14, 2 Timothy 14 and 15. You'll see it there where he talks about them being led astray. Other apostles wrote similar warning in 2 Peter 2, 1, John 1, 7, and Jude 1, 4. The understanding of the true gospel and the focus on the kingdom of God were minimized and lost over centuries after the end of the New Testament era. It was lost. It started to fade out. I'm going to give you the key factor as to why, right? It started to fade out. A key factor in this was Emperor Constantine, right? acceptance of a popular form of Christianity and its subsequent ab adoption as the official religion of the Roman Empire. When Constantine came in, and there's a couple more you hear in there about quote unquote founding father, their acceptance and their belief system started to change it. It went from being Christ being the head to a hierarchy, which the king was the head, the pope was his ear and his mouth, and they started to build a structure in which they could control the information and control the people. Thus their religious system came into place. They pushed back the kingdom, which gave you your dominion power and authority to lead and to walk in discipline, self-control. And they were now the gatekeepers keepers of what they would tell you they were right to represent you before God. Thus they have the priest and the confessional and you have them come into a man to get access to God and you have to pray through Mother Mary. All that came in when Constant came in and the different forefathers came in and they took the message, put it into a hierarchy form, 
push the Jews out, and now there's a structure of a hierarchy set up to where man was the head controlling all the information the people below would receive. This is where it started to lose its power in Christianity, and the message went from the kingdom to the gospel. They put the short form, and now they were literally trying to manipulate, control the power and the minds of the people. I have to end it there. My. So this is where it faded out. The new era came in, constantly come to power, the hierarchy of the church switch. It's no longer about the laws and the prophet, nor the Jews. It became about our organized religion and the Roman culture took over. Thus they incorporated um, paganism involved in that. A lot of the holidays, the day we worship, they kind of captured the Greek empire, incorporated Zeus, Herod, Diana, the whole nine yard into it, sanctified it, put a Christian sticker on it, made it holy, and people started to worship those things, don't realize what they're worshiping. You're not worshiping one true God, you're worshiping a pagan, because they sanctify many things you ought not to be worshiping. But most don't know that, so they just settle. So a lot of our holidays, our days are named after Greek, and mythological God. Most don't know that. Thor, Thursday. Saturday, Saturn. Sunday, worship the sun. Monday, worship of the moon. Moon day. Sunday. Saturn day. Thor's day. I can give you all the names. It's all mythological came through them. This were worshiping the gods of heaven. And they're all idols. They just took it, incorporated it in it, and passed the information down to us. So most of the teaching that come from our churches come out of the Roman Catholic culture. Oh, we don't use the title so we are Catholics. But who gave us the information? They did. Who doctored it up and determined what was acceptable was not? They did. How is it we have 66 books in our Bible? They have 76. Explain to me that one. Ah, oh, well, that's another study. That's a whole other research. So do your research, please. Investigate. Study out how you got the stuff you got. Study out why you believe what you believe. Question what you hear. Don't accept it for being as truth. Even what I'm telling you, do your own research. Study to show yourself. Research for you. Because you're going to stand before God without me or anybody else. So you got to know that this word is truth and you got to know it for yourself. And you'll stand before God by yourself. So I challenge you to research for yourself to find out where this stuff is coming from. Then you know how to function properly in our day. If you have a misconception, be misled, you're going down the wrong path. The blind lead the blind. The Bible said they never lead you to hell. They both lead you to hell. It's important for us to understand. God bless you all. We love you. Look forward to seeing you next week. We'll pick up here. I'm going to tell you what Paul preached. And we'll continue to do that. God bless you all. We love you. Look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye now.